And uh, I just want to mention a few things. I want to thank uh, the Arts Council of Princeton, Janet Stern for her support, and Sue Roth, of course, uh, at the library. Um, our uh, video people, uh, Mike Litwin's been here for every single reading, and his assistants tonight, Yvonne and Carol. I want to thank them. Um, if you haven't signed up yet for the open mic and you want to read after the two featured speakers, we'd be happy to have you. Um, both the poets tonight have brought books that are for sale, and we also have copies of US One Worksheets, which is the uh, group that sponsors this reading. And we're also, uh, we have a, a period of open submission right now for our next volume of the worksheets if you want to get the web information from me. Um, so our first reader tonight is Wanda Praisner. She's been a longtime member of the group. She's uh, received many uh, awards, both nationally and regionally, for her poetry. And she is a poet in the School for the New Jersey State Council on the Arts. And her book, a uh, recent book that's out, is called A Fine and Bitter Snow. Here's Wanda. Thank you, Ellen. How are we doing for sound? Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, great. Well, thank you to Princeton Library first, and uh, also to Sue Roth and Ellen for all of their efforts on behalf of the reading. Um, so good to see you all here. I live up north, so I left very early through all the commuting traffic and the downpours, and I thought, no one will be there. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for being here. And to the US One Poets, I need to say this. Always the need to raise the bar whenever I'm in your, in your presence, your artistic excellence. Thank you. Uh, I'm happy that Maddie and I can be here together. Uh, her poetry and her teaching are a constant presence in my life. And I value her friendship and her generosity of spirit. She's a special lovely and lively lady, as you'll find out. <laughs> So I'll begin with a few poems um, from the manuscript on the, on the Bittersweet Avenues of Pomona, which just won the Spire Press Chapel Contest. The Coal Man by the Cellar's Shoot. Their parents have gone to the Paramount to see Betty Grable in Moon over Miami. Me stop at Harmony Park for a pitcher of beer. Do what your brother says. Wallpaper roses peel open in the heat. Her brother calls her to his room. His pants are open. From almost as far away as the stone cellar, she hears him talking of what she can do. Then silence. He is waiting for an answer. She remembers winter. The coal man by the cellar shoot looking at her. She hears herself say, no goes back to dress her paper dolls. She puts a sequined gown on Hetty Lamar, an off-the-shoulder lace on Veronica Lake, dances them across her chenille spread. She watches her chest go in and out, only holding her breath stops it. Next day, coming down to breakfast, they hear a news report of a canvas sack found by the tracks, a strangled child inside, footprints left behind. Crouched by the banister, they listen as their parents move in the kitchen. She pictures the girl alive, braids tied in plaid ribbon, the look in her blue eyes of what she cannot stop. They continue down the stairs. She hears the morning freight chugging into Grasmere Station, her brother warning her not to tattle, or the next time she loses at knuckles, he'll angle the deck of cards down so hard on her fist he'll draw blood, doubles if she flinches, cries, or pulls away. The setting for this is the 1940s. It's one of my Aunt Helen poems. Um, you, you, know, you write a poem and you think you're done, and then more poems come up. She was naughty. <laughs> On the bittersweet avenues of Pomona, 
All morning, Aunt Helen lets me watch. I feel grown up. She wiggles into navy crepe, bends to buckle ankle strap high heels, says I can come along, but mustn't tell Grandpa. I like our reflections in the mirror as she strokes on dark red lipstick. I tell her she looks like a movie star, and she puts pink lipstick on me, warning, loose lips, sink ships. <laughs> we make sure Grandpa's taking care of his gray barber and beehives, doesn't see us leave. She carries a shoulder bag like a wave or whack, explains how being nice to the military supports the war effort. <laughs> we wait on the corner of DeKalb and Necker for the sailors to pull up. We ride through Pomona, and Helen giggling in the back. We stop in Silver Lake Park. In the rear view mirror, I see her lipstick smudged, blonde pompadour loosened from bobby pins. The sailor in front asks if I want a kiss, but I dare not answer. After Aunt Helen's done being patriotic, they drop us off. She hurries in, straightening her black seamed stockings. I go watch Grandpa handling his purple grapes. A gray spider dangles from the vine. How was the shopping in Fort Richmond? We had a good time, I tell him, still tasting the lipstick on my mouth. I recently saw the Dolly exhibit in uh, Philadelphia, so this reminded me of this poem. That reminded me of this poem. The persistence of memory. The dream drifts off. Images melt like Dolly's watches. Once my mother asked him for his autograph, said it was for her daughter, an art major, and he stroked on a double star. My mother unable now to remember one moment to the next. But ask her about that crossing on the SS America and she'll describe Dolly's jeweled cane and waxed mustache, the tiny wife who met him at the pier, my mother who treads water in an opaque ocean, no land in sight, like those lab mice swimming in milky water, a place to stand on hidden below the surface. After a few times in the tub, the normal mice remember where the platform is. But those missing a protein in the brain continue to swim in circles. Ladybugs and Mrs. Dalloway. A thousand ladybugs sun outside on the house. Impossible to film them as they fly into my hair, cover my clothes, some crimson. But most of the orange gold of border marigolds planted to keep the bugs away. The number of dots varies. Today is a day for noticing. Like Mrs. Dalloway, I bought bouquets of flowers, not for my party, but to celebrate a new granddaughter. Pink carnations for her, blood red roses for her mother. Ladybugs blanket the door, enter as I go in, their need for warmth, for continuance, some sense of what's to come. It's October. My grown children about to go pumpkin picking in the sun. From an upstairs bug-speckled window, I watch them go. I've come up into the tower alone and left them. The newborn in my arms, not my own. I'll read a few now from another manuscript called Where the Dead Are. I just wrote this, I think, last week and workshopped it last week. That's okay. In Gillen Bay, the Bahamas, 2004. I'm a mile, mile out in Gillen Bay collecting sand dollars, talons, and cockle shells and suddenly there's no bottom to stand on. This is how the Chinese cockle pickers must have felt stranded out in England's Morecambe Bay, tide coming in like a galloping stallion as they dug on mud flats filling buckets, panic, struggling to stay afloat, exhaustion, acceptance, a letting go. 
I tread water, calm down, tell myself I can swim against the current moving me from shore. Somehow, I gain control and make it back. Guru Binglung's last call on his cell phone to his wife 5,000 miles away. I am up to my chest in water. Maybe I am going to die. The drowned identified by watches and wallets, their photos and good luck charms. I was in northwestern England uh, last year, and this had the, the, the cockle pickers that had just happened uh, a few months before, and they were still there uh, collecting cockles. I think now they've, they've put a ban on it. Uh, Weimar, uh, city of culture, named such in 1999, um, city of, of Goethe and Schiller, and uh, Mozart and Liszt and Nietzsche were there. And uh, Hitler knew this early on, went there. And, um, you know, all over at Weimar there are banners for Goethe's Salve, Hail. So Hitler borrowed this with his Heil. Also, when you go through Weimar, there's just like one small um, sign for Buchenwald. But when you get up there, it's filled with students. Classes. From the Edis oh, one more thing. The Edisburg I mentioned, it's a hill. And it's just one hill on this great plain all by itself. From the Edisburg Memorial. Goethe's oak tree on the Edisburg was spared when Buchenwald was built. It stood between the kitchen and the laundry, a stump now, cemented in the center. Goethe sketched alders and black poplar along the elm. He painted his stately city home the same golden shade as the maidenhair tree he brought to Weimar. Salve, his usual greeting, is lettered on the threshold. In the cobblestone courtyard stands the carriage he used in town and up the Edisburg, where he spoke his maxim, let man be noble, helpful, and good. From the crematorium, you can see the bear basin in the SSU and Goethe's Oak. American generals made townspeople climb the five steep miles up the Edisburg, men with hats in hand, women smiling, then holding handkerchiefs to their faces. We didn't know, they said. From the memorial, the sweep of countryside takes your breath away. In Sweden, 2002, the pallbearers are Kurdish women dressed in black, heads bare, faces white. They sustain a sister, her refusal to enter an arranged marriage, a matter of family honor, pressure from clansmen. No matter her pleas, the Swedish police, politicians, the media. In the black and white news photo, the women carry a meter high headshot of Fatima ahead of the coffin. She stares out to the right of the camera, dark eyes opaque, already dead. Resignation captured on her calmly face, eyes wide open, having seen her father's eyes having pictured her father's gun at her head. And in the last six months, uh, six women were murdered um, in Berlin. And of course, in Turkey, if a young girl just looks at a boy, uh, the youngest member of her family murders her. <clears throat> in Johannesburg, 2002. Saturday night, the hostel hall packed. Men in purple suits, velvet vests, and polka dot ties vie for best dressed award, a prize of six dollars. No matter barbed wire and bullets outside, inside, there's style. Without music or spotlight, the gentlemen strut across a cement floor, pants creased, blade sharp, wingtips polished. A smooth shuffle, a slow spin, tip of a fedora, smiles lingering long after the applause. 
I feel important here, says Piet Zulu, who on weekdays mixes cement. When I walk, I walk tall. On special days like Christmas, the winner is given a live goat. Whenever I'm in a suit, I tell myself I'm beautiful. And a few from, um, well, from my book. Yeats said, man is love and loves what vanishes. What more is there to say? Well, I've had a lot to say, like half of this book. <laughs> Okay. Paracorm with an epigraph from Coleridge, that sunny dome, those caves of ice. For social studies, I show my old slides of Mongolia. The five of us entering Ulaanbaatar's Hotel B, where flies blacken the breakfast but ignore the white yogurt. My family by the propeller plane on a sandy runway, a student asks, is that really you? And I answer, yes. The yaks and Bactrian camels in the Gobi, where sun never reaches the snow and ice in Yolan Am, Valley of the Eagles. Then the slide of my son on a Mongolian horse. Only vast desert and the owner's felt and canvas yurt in the background. This very spot where Marco Polo came to Karakoram, Kubla Khan's pleasure dome. The palace garden, angel fountains offering wayfarers honey, yogurt, milk, water, and vodka. Only a stone turtle left to mark the place. I tell how these high-cheeked people may have crossed a land bridge to America. A student asks, is that the son who died? And I answer, yes. Um, this next poem, this next poem always reminds me of uh, what Proust said about real discovery consists not in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. I'd been to Cairo before, but now I was there and I was a different person with different eyes. Between midnight and noon, Cairo Museum. It's not only in the nowhere of nighttime the dead come back. Tourists wear t-shirts of Tutankhamun and his queen arrayed in ceremonial silver, sharing a pair of sandals. At his exhibit, a photo of his feet taken after the tomb was opened, black and gold sandals, toenails, long, white. Reflected in the glass case, I can see my son's feet, P219. Picture them there under tufted silk, the coffin of ash wood I chose. Beside the courtyard pool, we film the white lotus blossom the guy tells us closes each night, reopens in day. Finding words to fit the music. A friend has lost a child. What is there to say? You've been there and come back. You go to pay respects, sort out simple tones, try on stately phrases, as though standing before a three-way mirror, looking for what might be suitable to wear. You turn to see the view from every angle, but nothing seems to fit seems right. It won't be you. It won't be her. You think instead of Bach, his funeral cantata on the car radio. His stay in Lübeck to hear Bucks to Hootie. Baroque music of such complexity and depth that on return to Orange Dock, Bach's playing was so altered it confused the congregation. They hardly recognized the hymns. Roped for tunes, their young organists now decorated with strange chords, foreign counterpoints, a new intensity of feeling. Parishion is unable to accept his music would never sound the same. And 
I'll conclude with one more. Well, that's the conclusion. Crossing Pollock's Field. Beyond leaded window panes, falling snow seems fixed as a panel of Alonson lace. It layers woodland grasses, bandages and bombs bent yucca leaves. White life comes to a dead maple, decorations to an evergreen where rolled up spiders the size of periods on a page lie hidden in the bark. This silence, altered only as I enter the delicate tatting, allow it to cover me, net me in implausible elation. I could be a child again. Snagged in its webbing, I am the snowfall, watching my footprints form from my forward motion the weight of my body. Inside this scene, I am the scene, and nothing is not mine. No other movement but a fox crossing Pollock's field, and snow, heavier now, already filling the tracks. Thank you. Thank you, Wanda. What I really enjoy about these readings is when we do the workshops, we sort of hear people's kind of creaky work and one at a time. And this is really nice to hear the whole uh, piece. So um, we're just going to take a really quick break if somebody wants to sign up for the open mic or go to the bathroom, but come right back in five minutes. Thanks. My name's Jim Walden, and I'll read uh, one poem. <coughs> Not too long. An ear to time. I say the ear was first to know time, before the eye, before the skin, the nose, the tongue. The ear that lay pressed to the earth heard eruptive seed, as its twin heard bird song, pearl of brook. The ear first announced time as a stream with bubbles of fear in it, rainbow bubbles on it. The ear heard the snorting sun rise, the creaking sun set, a new time. That was when I saw chubby baby fingers became hoar-frosted icicles. When the back of the hand became translucent, with blue ridges running through it, time pressing on. When smell and taste began to matter, to demand time for themselves, for stroking soft leather and dipping crusts in fragrant tea and filling the mouth with buttery cake. When the mind sorted out light and dark into days and flayed time flat, cut it into pieces, a calendar of weeks, months, and years, whose hours became long, long intervals, whose minutes and seconds became tedious moments, the ear tacked time to space, warping shape, giving gravity its due. In Einstein's inner ear, the atom bomb went off. An alarm clock rasping to the mind, wake up, pull yourselves together. Stop wasting time being clever. My name's Arlene Wiener, and some of you may understand the references in, in this. Couple dancing. When Pop said, get me another, will you, while Arthur Murray was on, Mom would rumba to him, try to get him up to dance. On the TV, Catherine was twirling around Arthur, chirpy as a mockingbird on a chimney, still leaping and whistling at midnight. Arthur tall and stone-faced all the while. 
I thought it must have been Catherine who sold the TV deal, wrote the jingle, built the business, while Arthur sat like a cornerstone, established 1938. One night in 1960, my Aunt Marie came back from the Trocadero Lounge where they did the twist and told my mother, you don't have to worry what they're doing after the dance because they've already done it at the dance. <laughs> Pretty soon dancing wasn't about steps, wasn't couple dancing, it was everyone with everyone. But Arthur and Catherine kept going, kept gliding along. It was hard to imagine that mom and pop met at a dance, but they did. My sister asked once, and Marie said pop danced better than mom, especially Latin. He had that rhythm, Marie said. Your mother was too good of a girl to know to move her hips. <laughs> Okay, and I will transgress a little bit and read a more characteristic and short poem. Life List. All those sightings, pursuits, bad weather, climbs, disappointments epitomized. The blue kingfisher true to the crooked stream. Cardinal at the sill, common, but she hopes heart lifting. Exotic dream in the desert, scissor-tailed flycatcher. Duck, dick thistle, indeterminate brown sparrow elusive in the scrub. This life list, reticent, small-sized, ordered and numbered. His life contracted into a fist. If we pried, it might hide only two pennies or a found robin's egg shell, an owl's barbless down feather. and the Arts Council and Sue Roth in the library, and especially our valiant Channel 30 people who do this out of the goodness of their hearts to immortalize poetry. <laughs> You're the best. We love you. And we didn't mention one of Madeline's books, which is called Mary of Migdal. And this is a passion we both have for Mary Magdalene. So I thought I'd read you that from... Volume 3 of Cool Women, we've already paid back our publishing costs and we just launched it in April, partly thanks to Sue in the library. Magdalene. Loving you, I see. Christ must have made love to Mary Magdalene. Of course. He was here to become fully human. Through tumultuous, impossible months, I have been shown and shown. Nothing is more human and passion, especially when everything on earth is shouting, thou shalt not. They had to be mad for each other. Leaving her must have been his gravest sacrifice. Who but a lover washes someone's feet with her hair? I'm very happy to be here, and the quality of the poetry is so inspiring that it's really taken a lot of courage to come up here and read. So thank you for being so patient. <laughs> I'm also chairing the West Windsor Arts Council Summer Solstice Poetry Reading, and we're having a wonderful lineup, and afterwards there's an open reading, so I really encourage you to come and to sign up to read and to listen to the high quality poetry that will be there that night as well. And it's June 25th, uh, Saturday night, behind Panera off of Route 1. And there'll be lots of publicity, and Carolyn Foot Edelman, who's one of the best publicists I've met in forever, um, is doing the publicity. So you won't be able to miss the advertisements for it. Um, recently, I started, uh, I had the opportunity to teach poetry, to try to teach poetry to children. And from it, we've been working with a book by Kenneth Koch, uh, Rose, Where Did You Get That Red? And we've been doing list poems. And because of that, I've fallen in love with list poems. But I do try to do a little more with it than just lists. But through it, I also found that I do have a love affair with the color red. So I'd like to share this with you, called Going Nowhere with Red, inspired by red. Imperious red demands 
to be seen from Neolithic man and matter weave, ancient Hebrews, Greeks, and Romans, red, their symbol for power and beauty, Sindhur dawn, Indian bride's hair, Chuda bangles for the Punjabi girl, red is bright, sun as it rises, lively and joyous, arousing good fortune, red is passion, the sun as it sets, powerful, vain and angry, Adam's red clay, the blood of man, the red See the red plain of the red baron, liberty and justice for all, the red hair of Queen Elizabeth the first, red beard of the feared pirate, the red plumes of the sun king's hat, the red lancers of Napoleon Bonaparte, the red of the Roman Catholic cardinal's cap, red of lips and poetry. See the girl with the red dress on, red fingernails, red planet, David Bowie's red shoes, the red eye, red slippers, the ruby red slippers, the red of the Mediterranean murex mollusk, the robes of kings, West African mourners, Tibetan monks, free of desire, the red of the scratch, the lobster, red herring, the flamingo, and its shrimp supper, red roof hotel, for all those red, beware, red square. Well, there's another page and I actually didn't credit. Sorry. No, I did. Okay. Red light. The red light district, red ants, warning signals, stop signs, red in the morning, sailors warning, the scarlet letter, seeing red for all these, praise the red, red roses, red faces, red at night, sailors delight, red garnets, red rubies, red, red grapefruit, Japanese red maple, ripe red strawberries, the red, white, and blue, Elizabeth Arden's red door, red envelope, red lipstick, red cross, red riding hood mask, the red death, red heads. Mediterranean red barrel roots, exit signs, robin redbreast, male cardinals, simply red, the traditional reds, the editor's pen, X's, candy canes, holiday trim, Valentine's, red hot, burning, blowing, a flame. <laughs> okay. And one quick one, just to show my other slide that I don't just list things. I'm, this is called Living Postcard. A white-haired man bent on bleachers, peaked cap, dark lens glasses, shade his moist and faded eyes, watching baseball at the high school, a blue and blowing day in May. The ricochet, aluminum meeting leather, dusty slide and collide, hit snagged by the pitcher, fly pop calculated and caught, prideful bellows and seasoned commands from the white-haired man in the stands, Bring them home, boys. Bring them home. It's a living postcard. Wish you were here, Beth. Mm -hmm. um, my first home will be Sonnet 199. This is my 199th sonnet. It's um, a sonnet that was an exercise from a book called Western Wind. It happened to be on page 199, and all the uh, all the final words on each line were listed. And the, and one thing I'd like to say is that the she mentioned in the first line happens to be uh, Dr. Beverly Bush, and uh, she's um, she's a, a person that loves poetry and inspired me, and uh, certainly she was the uh, the reason I'm here as far as that goes. But, uh, in any case, <clears throat> she assigned two sonnets. I felt quiet. Winter warmed my spine with an icy kiss, my mind as calm as the Los Angeles riot, my thoughts as bright as light in an abyss. Should I write of bright birds blurred in trees or waving flowers greeting me in June, perhaps my palate laid upon by peas, or hugs by sticker bushes as I prune. What tales of winter's finest, what of tales of winter's finest crystal, arrayed like glasses hanging in a bar? Or crisp, sharp tunes composed by a pistol, like staccato fingers jar a guitar. So much page was wasted while I brooded that the sonnets hastily concluded. <laughs> so 
something a little more serious, uh, icicles. Not too serious, but icicles. Icicles. Roof-bound icebergs. Ice cream cones without the cone or the cream, like Lancelot's lance. Carrots rooted in the air. Dunce caps for upside-down dunces. Grown, drip by drip, from crying snow like Pinocchio's nose, lie by lie. A tear on the nose, almost breaking free. Hanging, halting, waiting, joining. Candles, wax melting from the unlit end. Stained glass without the stain. Daddy's reflection in a little boy's eyes. Glowing from knowing God's love. Crystal sunshine, curtains of glass leaking Shekinah. But time claws and gnaws and draws its mark upon the ephemera of this world, even icicles, the remnants of a popsicle half eaten, like a man past fifty, clutching, tears on the pillow, sweat on the nose, dropping. Drop a desperate thing like grit teeth, diminishing glory. Time's tiny grappling hooks slip, slide, and catch and snatch, tugging, tugging, an ice cube in the bottom of the glass, earthbound destiny, waxed glass underfoot, a frosty mug sweating on the counter, an iceberg stranded and stranded in the Sahara, rippling in the wind, a stagnant pool going damp, an infected wound oozing, a puddle running dry, guzzled away by crooks. Mm -hmm. This one, in, in light of the strange weather that we've gone back into, um, we can go back a little further and some of you will remember this strange weather effect that we had mm, a month ago. Everything is golden. On a soft evening as April contemplates May, the solid sky breaks up, letting the sun through as it slides toward the closing of a day of clouds and cool breezes, bright with new blossoms and leaves but not benign, as some of our April days have been this year. A curious light draws me outside, a sign of something that makes the precise season clear. It is the time before a universal green will fall over the trees like a cargo net. Each has its color, its underlit glow. The scene is like one skillfully managed for a stage set, where a portentous encounter must be planned to call for this fiery light across the plain domestic land. And another different season. Um, I've just come back from a week in California and in Santa Monica we encountered this scene. In addition to morels, the market stalls offer wild strawberries, goose eggs, lavender, multicolored potatoes, the size and shape of arthritic old men's thumbs. Further along, there are blood oranges, sweet lemons, and their products, marmalade, juice, and sample wedges to sink teeth into and tear away from pith and rind. A man has set up his knife grinding wheel in the middle of the street, between cheeses and the breads just waiting to be chunked into picnic servings. Tomatoes would be perfect with them, with apricots to follow, or those wild strawberries, white and red, evanescent trophy of early summer.
Bonnie Bryson, I'm happy to be here as well. Uh, so many old friends. Uh, I guess that's why we do keep coming and we keep doing this. Um, since I had been writing lyrics for many, many years, when I first started writing poetry, which was about a year ago, um, it was very, very difficult for me to just think, gosh, I can have as many words as I want, or as few, or as many syllables, you know, because writing lyrics, I, I write music as well. So I think partly as a crutch, um, everything in the beginning was a haiku or a tanka, because I had to count, and it had to be just right. So then I realized that these things are all over the place. You just never think about it, but they're there. For example, here's one by James Joyce. Um, this is from a book that I wrote where everything has a musical title, a song. So the title of this is It's All Right With Me, but I know you'll recognize it. Drew him down to me so he could feel my breasts, all perfume, yes. And his heart was going like mad, and yes, I said, yes, I will, yes. It's a perfect tonka. Now, this is a lover's question. That's what I decided to call it. It's by Mae West. Is that a gun in your pocket, or are you happy to see me? Believe it or not, that's a haiku. Now this is uh, called The Fungus Among Us. It's a true story. At a poetry reading, I recently heard twice in one night the same obscure word. A day or two later, to my dismay, I heard it again. It won't go away. This time, the title, that's even worse. It's bad enough when it lurks in the verse. A shy little word that lives in the shade. It shrivels when too much attention is paid. Because Billy Collins decided to use it doesn't give poets the right to abuse it. I hope no one talks about lichen tonight. But if you like lichen, please, say the word right. When you're out hiking, you often see lichen. It grows on the side of a rock or a tree. If you're open micin' and looking for lichen, or lichen, or lichen, the bedroom or kitchen is where you should be. Thank you. I have to stop laughing to read my poem. Guess what? A sonnet. Um, this is called Feral, uh, and I wrote it up in our country home in the Catskills, so it's a, a New York State poem, not a New Jersey poem. Feral. A huge barn cat emerges in the field, finds a good vantage point, relaxes, suns, alert to what the meadow's bound to yield, inertia merely poised, prepared to lunge. A bobcat's markings, bobcat's close, sharp ears, the vigil of a thick, surveillant tail. He's moved from house to barn, from there outdoors, widening opportunities to kill. The dog begins to whine against the glass. Her eyes lock with the cat's. Now she barks wild. Between mere window and some meadow grass. She clamors for a similar exile. Caught indoors, she and I, lit by the gaze of captivating menace. For now, safe. Um, I'm Jane McKinley. I'm very happy to be here, and it's, I feel like celebrating because it was about a year ago this week that I went to my first US-1 meeting, and it's changed my life. Um, I'm going to read two sonnets. Uh, the first one is rhymed. The second one is freer in a, in a certain way. Mud season, second grade, mid-April. Blood roots promise in the air. We ride along with Dad to see the piglets born the night before. The pickup swerves, jiggles to a halt. Dad's face goes gray, 
his dark hair stamped with sweat. He climbs down, then collapses near the ditch. Run for help, leave Philip here. I fly, my winged heads barely grazing, smeared with mud, reach a tar-patched farmhouse, wrap as sharp as knuckles can, scared no one will come. The winter door creaks open, and a child peeks out. It's Debbie Tucky. She's the one we laughed at last week, haunting her with combs. Her mother holds my shoulder while her wild-haired, gentle father rushes to the phone. The next one's a little bit lighter. <laughs> Becoming Pan. Her hair's grown shaggy. Woolens feel like skin. And all the world seems tied up in the reeds she's plucked, whittled, stuck into twin pipes. In Phrygian mode, she dreams of dying sheep. Her hardened feet tucked underneath a row of woven ostrich plumes. By day, these dreams turn corners, change to song. Fierce dissonances melt to unison. The stones she stumbled over, lugged from field and plain, she's rearranged to form a grotto, refuge from the pain. Sweet nymphs and satyrs goad her to run wild, to let her songs float body through the air. The voice she'd lost wells up inside. She blows it out through angled pipes, hears panic shift to God. It was hot the year I was born. My mother told me she crunched ice chips all that day and tonight. And early in the morning, I was suffered out by old Dr. Feeling House, dipped in a pan of warm water, wrapped in a flannel scarf. Picasso, not yet young, had completed Guernica. And a strange Einstein worked on the laws of physics in Princeton. Pearl Buck was settled in Bucks Camp, Pennsylvania, in a house that kept growing. Virginia Woolf began her death watch. Franklin was president, and Eleanor, a plain woman, truthful and loyal, writes, my day. Harry S. Truman, out of the loop in Washington, made loops of his own. Hitler owned Czechoslovakia, where my second husband was 12. My first husband was seven in the Bronx, New York City. God help me, I wish he had married his mother. <laughs> we had a lot of Einstein in our poems tonight, though. Um, I just want to invite everybody back on June 22nd for uh, Judith Adowd and Colin Campbell. Colin's coming from Trenton and he's bringing some people with him, so that should be interesting. And uh, thanks everybody for coming tonight.